But I'll tell you about something else we really ought to look at, especially in these times. It has to do with COVID-19, the recoveries, the discharges, but even more, the dangers related to stigmatization, uh, which currently is being overlooked by and large. Now, some recovered individuals are finding it difficult to reintegrate because they and their families are being stigmatized to the extent that traders are not able to go back to the market to continue their business or even make purchases for their households as children are also isolated. If not dealt with, people will hide their condition uh, with the risk of not seeking help, which endangers their lives and rapidly infects more people unwittingly. And that's a grave concern. Now, joining us this morning, we have two people who are going to be uh, walking us through what exactly the dynamics are, what they've noticed, what we should be looking at as a country and how to get out of this. Dr. Kojo Essel is a medical uh, doctor at Health Essentials. Uh, Dr. Essel, a very good morning to you. Thank you. Good morning. Also joining the conversation, Edwin Boache is a clinical psychologist. Of course, a lot to talk about in that area as well. Uh, Mr. Boache, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Right, so as we delve into it, uh, we're also going to be talking about someone's real lived experiences. Yes. You know, someone who has been there, done that. I recall at the start of this, a few people came out saying, we're being stigmatized. We, we said a lot about it, and then at a point in time, it just tapered off. Yes. But a lot of people are still going through that. And suffering. Doc, what have you noticed that even got, you know, all of this together with Water Aid Ghana and all of that. What is it that you noticed out there? Okay, so in, this was actually started by Water Aid Ghana. Mm. So they had done, you know, they deal with the markets and lorry stations a lot when it comes to hygiene. Mm. So they had realized that many people were unable to come back to work. You know, the traders were not allowing them back mm. to sell their wares. And even their family members were prevented from coming to the market. Nobody wanted to come to you. So they, they had done this rapid um, study which showed that, yes, people were afraid and people had so much information, many of them misconceptions, and so they were scared of having them back, thinking that they would be um, infected. So um, big things that came up, you know, people were not willing to um, declare what was wrong with them, which means they were hiding away, they were hiding. Um, so, and other things were um, because they had, um, were not able to um, apply their trade. What it meant was poverty started coming in. They couldn't afford basic things. And um, that even leads to malnutrition, which means the whole family is now even at risk of more conditions or more illnesses or diseases. Um, we also found that because they are not getting um, into their regular spaces. Nobody wants to come close to you. They felt isolated. That's mm. a great area for, and there were mental health challenges developing. So you meet with them and people are very, very hurt. They think that uh, they were not treated fairly. These are the very people I was dealing with in the market before I got COVID. Exactly. Now these people are they shunning me. They don't even want me. to have anything yes. to do with me. And the anger was not just directed at, um, at their um, counterparts, but also to the, government and Ghana Health Service. Why? They felt that the way they were taken out of the market, for instance, when they were, um, we thought that they had um, COVID, was not fair. And so because of the, um, what would I say? The circumstances around which they, were, they left the market, and then later, maybe three weeks, four weeks, they were trying to come back. It was done publicly, which made uh, more eyes, you know, um, them. So um, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of um, hate, they feel isolated, and then worst of all, they are not getting the basic um, things they need. Mr. Bachet, now from, from the psychological standpoint, I mean, uh, you would know better. What, what sort of processes go on with these people on the psychological level? H how does this leave them, this stigmatization? All right, so basically when we look at um, uh, cordiality and relationship, mm. You know, today we are here talking, the next day you're shunning away from me because of the nature with which I was escorted from the market, like he was saying. Sirens and ambulances, especially in the early days. Mm -hmm. And then when they are coming, they are not coming announced like they were taken away. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, it gives them the impression that, indeed, people are looking down on them. People don't even want to associate with them. So even when someone is trying to be nice, sometimes they may think that, oh, he just wants to listen and go and tell the others. 
And so, like he said, the anger is not only related to the people, but uh, the general system, if I should put it. Mm. When, when it happens like this, individuals, and it's so normal with all of us, we are scared of the future, the fear of the unknown. What if it happens to me again? Mm. Who is coming to purchase from me? How am I going to sustain relationship? And so when, when, when um, people are isolated, when people are discriminated against, it hurts their, themselves, it affects their self-esteem. Mm. They feel less of human. And so for someone who has had COVID and recovered, for them, they may think that forever in their lives, they are not going to be the same as they were. Let's, let's assume someone is selling in Makola Market. Mm -hmm. you, you have, they usually have specific places where they sell. If you're selling cloth, you are in a particular zone and all of that, and you have a specific spot. Mm -hmm. You're going to be there for practically years, yeah, decades. Of your and so everyone can identify that as a senior, and, and you have to go through that. So it's not just the economic impact you're going to face, mm -hmm. but, but how severe is this mental impact, would you say, okay. from, from the experiences, people who have shared stories with you? How bad is it? So, well, I mean, if you ask me how bad, I would say very bad. On a scale very of 1 bad, to 10? I would say, I could say 9. And nine. That, that's just being scientific. Because, I mean, I'm giving margin for errors. Now, this is because, like you rightly said, they are on the same spot, identified. You know, when someone is selling food and he, he, she's identified as a very good, maybe the washi is very, <laughs> it, it, it tastes good. Everyone goes there. There could be so many other watcher sellers, but the concentration is on this person. This is the case where the person has been picked out and selected as having a problem, having a sickness that is very contagious, that can cause trouble to all of us. And the point is, like I said, uh, there is no medical person who has come to them to tell them, hey, this person is fully recovered. There is nothing wrong again. Mm. And so, yes, indeed, they wouldn't even associate. And like I said, I mean, in your mind, when you think that this is going on behind you, it can affect your, your self-esteem, as I said. It could, it could cause you stress, anxiety, depression, and interestingly, post-traumatic stress disorder. That is when um, uh, some trauma has happened to you. And then after that, so let's say six months after, a year after, beyond, you still are having some symptoms or some, some feelings that you are having in the immediate, just like a robbery attack and you're panicking. And then six years on, six months on, you're still panicking like the way it happened immediately. So it, 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 for some people, it happens in like manner yes, with them. Yes, exactly so. Wow. You remember even the lady we met who is even suicidal. She mm -hmm. feels that I better end it all so that I'm free. You know, it can get wow. that. Yes. It can H get that how bad. old is this lady? Um, 50 something, yes. 50s. 50 something. Yes. And she wanted to end her life yes. Yes. because of COVID-19 stigmatization. Exactly. Because now she says she goes to the, now after a long time, she's been able to go back into the market, but nobody buys from her. We, wow. Yeah, we're not we're getting Wow. So we're still working wow. on this, so, um, Edwin. About how many people are we talking of that you've engaged? Can you give us a fair um, idea? At the moment, when it comes to people with extreme, about 15. Mm -hmm. But then, about of course, there are other people that they've told us about. But, you know, you take time with these things. It takes a them. long time to... And of course, that's yes. on the project. So yes. These are people we have identified. The, there could be so many others. Yeah. The project is only in three municipal assemblies as of now. Right. Kwapim North, um, Pong Katamanso, mm -hmm. and then Nanumba North. Do you know my biggest worry? Mm -hmm. Those who may be facing this and may not even have access to the likes of you. Dr. Essel so, and Mr. Boache. I mean, you know, a lot of the time we suffer a lot of these things mm -hmm. in silence. Uh, so they are going through it. They are facing the mental challenges. The, for them, maybe the economic might not be so bad, but the mental health challenges, uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder and all of that, but they are not even getting access to anybody to share this with. So this project... How, with, how dangerous could that it be? It is extremely dangerous. This project with WaterAid and MasterCard Foundation, um, we are training trainers. You understand? So wow. part of it is train trainers who are going out there. So everywhere we go, you, you pick the opinion leaders, and then it, it runs across from um, market women, the queens, the um, lorry park station, all the way to chiefs, mm -hmm. the health, you know. And so these people are also going to start going out um, to, to sensitize people. Exactly. Now, apart from all that uh, Mr. Bwachi has mentioned, are there any other health complications that could arise as a, as, a, as a result of this stigmatization and all of that. Are there any yeah, others yeah. that so have not been The thing here is that once there is stigmatization, people delay 
um, reporting to the health facilities. Mm. It was like, hey, I suspect I have COVID, but if I go in and I'm diagnosed, I may have issues. So they come in late. You know, people try all sorts of things. And so, um, you know, COVID affects virtually every organ in the body. So people will come in late. That means they may have lung complications already. They may have kidney complications, liver complications and a lot of brain issues, you know, what we normally term loosely as foggy brain. So they are not even thinking straight and stuff like that. Mm. And we, beyond all this, you know, you can never have your protocols working effectively if there is stigmatization, clearly. Because if I have COVID, you invite me here, I'm going to come because if I say, oh, I'm not feeling well, you may start thinking, oh, maybe this guy has COVID. So people, if we don't strike um, stigma out quickly, People are going to hide and then delay um, treatment and also mix with people when we could just have step, stayed back a few weeks and then we are all healthy. So I'll have you do something. We're going to watch something on sure. our screens uh, sure. shortly, but I just want you to know that when we return, I would have us talk about David. I would just leave his name as David, yes. especially because maybe even mentioning his full name might lead to uh, some other forms of stigmatization. <laughs> and you share with me the story of David and why it's important to really be doing what we're doing in the studio currently. But right now, let's, let's just watch this. Great, so hopefully you learned something from that. All that pointing fingers at that person, it can make them feel unwanted, make them feel like outcasts. And before you know it, they want to take their lives, like was shared with us by Dr. Russell. But let's come back into the studio. So uh, maybe we could, instead of just sharing David's example, yes. the lady, the 50-something-year-old yes. lady who got suicidal. Yes. We, we can share both stories okay. and put them side, side by side, side for our, our viewers. Okay. I'll, I'll come All to right. you, Dr. Russell. All right. So the, this lady, I mean, works in one of the markets. And um, at the early parts when COVID started, probably in April or May, um, so someone who is close to her, was diagnosed with COVID, and I will come to using words appropriately as well. Mm. And so she was, together with other people, they were whisked away. So the, the ambulance had come to the market and taken them away, you know, and um, to an isolation center. Now, um, she came, when she, she was asked to go back home, and she came to the market, she wasn't allowed. Her friends were like, no. I see sure she's fine. You know, they found all sorts of things. Her, her family members come to the market. The, these and, were the other market women? Yes, the other market. And I think it's from fear, you know, because stigma, a lot of fear, a lot of misinformation will lead to that. There are very few people who do it out of uh, mischief, but most people. So then she started um, banging on the doors of municipal assembly, to, you know, anybody who will listen. And she, she is so... What I say, angry, mm. you know, um, what, what she's trying to say is that what if she hadn't availed herself? Would all this have come, you know? And um, so now her, her friends are shunning her. She says that nobody buys from her when she goes to the market. And e even now? The last time we, we went to the market with her, that was about two months ago, yes, right? Two months ago. Yeah. Because there's been practically a year that, that, of that COVID. Shows it. So people are still afraid. And as much as possible, that's why we are telling them that, look, this person has recovered. The person is only coming back because she is safe. Nobody is going to bring her in because she's not safe. But I think still we are not um, there yet. People are still afraid that, hey, this person has had it before. Maybe she has it again. So um, what she's saying is that she's lost so much money and she thinks that she should be compensated for the money lost, you know, because her Does she have, have an idea? Could, could she quantify how yes, much yes, she Yes, 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 yes. It was quite huge. I don't know if... Could, can you share with us? Um, would I remember that? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Well, was she taking something in the region of 5,000? Mm -hmm. Which I, I really doubted because I'm not, her, her area where she sells, I didn't see that big space that you, but she sells perishables, so okay. maybe. So she says she's lost the equivalent lost of about 5,000 5, CDs, CDs over this period over the, of not doing business. Yes, and you know that most of them, the markups are very small, so anything like that, it's, it's, it's a huge It's huge. Like, wow. Let, let's look at the story of David. Okay. What, what's his story? Okay. So this young man uh, has a fair idea what COVID is, has learned the signs and symptoms, and um, had experienced some magnificent symptoms. I mean, uh, to him, these were clear symptoms of, of COVID. And so uh, he, he had lost taste, he had lost a sense of smell. He goes to, to uh, test. And whilst awaiting the results, he had some drinks with friends 
who they had been doing this for a while. They observe all social distance protocols, all the protocols. And then along the line, he, he brings it up that indeed uh, I've been having these symptoms, which at least in this world, the way I was feeling could be. Then in a matter of 30 seconds, all their friends had vanished. Everybody excused themselves. Every, they they every, left where they left were. In the all drinking. I tell you. Everyone. Oh, Charlie, really, uh, um, I need to go somewhere. <laughs> He says they were about six. In a matter of 30 seconds, everyone had left her. Him. Wow. So there was not a single person who, who at least could have gone a step backwards and say, really, what happened? Tell me. How do you feel? Have you tested? What are they saying? No one. I think it boils down to the education, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Because even, even with people who back then, when HIV mm -hmm. made itself forcefully known in the late 70s, yes. 80s, mm -hmm. a lot of people had so many misconceptions. Oh, you can't even sit by the person and all of that. Yes. Ma Magic mm -hmm. Johnson is still alive. Oh, yes. And a lot of people now with art, antiretroviral, doing yes. very well, are, are living normal lives. Yes. Would you just say that it's on account of this being a novel disease new? Yes, one, one that's. And then two, the fear of the unknown. We are not, uh, we are not sure of what is happening. I mean, and I'll come to the point where we could even um, make it a positive angle for us. Now, this is happening to everybody in the world. COVID has come to everybody in the world. That alone should have given us the impression that we are fighting a common enemy. And so education is a very strong point because they are not sure. And of course, I wouldn't blame the, the not, not educating them on, on maybe government so much because in the first place it is, it is new not only to the lay person but it is also new to the medical profession right and so everyone is, is trying still learning to, about the disease to learn and quickly adjust and then make information available in the meantime when the information is not available the people still want and need to know so they come questioning they think and they speculate mm -hmm. and when the speculation is out of fear all of these will be but, 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 but to be realistic, people have called out maybe institutions, and I'm going to mention them, the NCC, mm -hmm. among others, for not doing enough. Uh, the information ministry was out there practically every week or two. Mr. President was on our television screens. But do you feel we've done enough? Because uh, looking at our literacy rate, looking at penetration when it comes to information and all of that, mm -hmm. it is mostly government that you would expect to be able yes. to disseminate information to the grassroots fail to do that, and someone in some, you know, back area, some mm -hmm. rural area, Which might really misunderstand areas, things, and, and the stigmatization. Look, we're talking about it here. I'm sure in the rural areas, it could be worse, mm -hmm. far worse. Mm -hmm. So, so wh where would you say, have you, do you think we've done enough by way of education? I wouldn't say enough, but we have done well. Mm. Now, we've done well in the sense that everyone has come on board. The media houses, you have done marvelously well. You didn't wait for the government to even come and say, do this. And so everyone has come on board. What it means then is, um, even if government is not doing up to enough, um, all hands are on deck. We are all trying to, and like, like this is what we are doing. So Water Aid has come in to, to preempt stigma and then make avenues, ways to mitigate all of these. And so when everyone comes on board, we don't put the burden on one person. You know, when we all carry the burden, it becomes lighter. Yeah. And so yes, I may not, I, I will agree with you that we have not done enough, but it means we are still doing and we, we need to keep doing. Because I mean, one year, one year of, um, one year plus of COVID, one would have thought that, oh, by now, uh, things are moving to normal, and so people are also beginning to accept people. But of course, uh, it is not there, and that is primarily there's, there's, because there's still are challenges yes. and then lack of ed uh, education. Okay, and you know, even with education, right. there's not much on stigma. So we are not doing enough, especially when it comes to stigma. We are talking about it. We are telling them how do you protect yourself and all that, exactly. but don't stigmatize. It, it, we you, need you to have now, a point yes, there. We need to now you know, emphasize on that a lot. Mm. If we want our protocols to work properly, we need to look at the stigma aspect. Be before we talk about this conjunctive, you know, work between Water Aid Ghana and the MasterCard Foundation, and even, yeah. you know, your project, Ghana Health Service. your project that you're working on currently, mm. this is also a human rights issue. Exactly. Mm. People have the right to be treated with dignity, respect, even per our constitution. Yes. Uh, 
how much of a human rights issue is it? What do you see and what do you think we should be looking at moving forward? So it, it's a big human rights issue because what, what is happening now is you may enter a facility, even a health facility, and if they are not prepared, if they don't have the right P, uh, PPEs, uh, they may not, you know, they may hesitate. Mm. And you may end up having somebody say, refer you even without doing the basic Sometimes thing. Sometimes you have even the medical professionals being the cause yes. of stigma. Yes. How, yes. I mean, the, the way we, have reported we, we communicate. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you, you have instances where even, even in the in medical facilities in Accra, you know, some of their, our colleagues have returned to work after recovering from COVID. And people were like, no, no, take a few more weeks Probably, at home yes. because, you know, people are uncomfortable. And even the way or the words we use, you know, as medical personnel, as media, because people, you, people sort of hook onto words that you use. So you hear things like suspected um, people Cases. with COVID. Mm -hmm. That makes people feel bad. Or you say that, oh, you are infecting um, people with COVID. That is bad. Right. So or psychologically, people are like, hey, I'm suspected of it. That's a big right, word. So what can we say things like, oh, somebody who's recovering from COVID-19, yes. right? Somebody who has acquired or contracted COVID-19 instead of suspected cases, instead of infecting people. Such words appear harmless, and almost everybody is using them, but they have a, a, a huge... There's a negative impact, connotation. Exactly, on our um, minds. So this is a part of the thing. I think we have a session where it's going to be more of media engagement. Mm. So we're probably going to do that virtually where we'll meet as many media personnel as possible to look at these because you, you guys are on, you are talking, and people will pick the words you use. You know. Come to think of it, we all may be culpable, complicit in a way, mm. because sometimes you say these things without even realizing, without intending mm -hmm. any harm. Exactly. But then, you know, there, there's Actually, some before we started this project, we were yeah. using the, those words too. Mm -hmm. right. And then we met the people and realized, that, hey, this is huge. You better watch the words you use. Something else that I feel could help lessen the stigma. Mm -hmm. Coming out to say it without, without of course, that, that in itself has some... Um, Pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at before Jani Selby, Dr. Jani Selby yes. uh, of yes. the NHI uh, A, the, the, the boss there. Before she came out, I, th I think she's the first person I recall, public officer, who came out to say, I've contracted COVID, I am self isolating, and all that. Uh, we had heard in media spaces of some people, and they never, never came out. It's later that they confirmed it. I believe that in itself created some fear, created some panic. I, I had survived it, I had not got it until somewhere in January this year. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. So I had to, of course, get the test and all of that. And when it was confirmed, I had to do the right thing and isolate and all that. Mm -hmm. But later, I felt it was my responsibility to let people know and exactly. not just be one of those people who, oh, I got it, I've survived it. OK, I pretend I never got it. Yes. I, I mentioned it. I've kept mentioning it and letting people know that even in my case, I had malaria, I had typhoid, I had COVID at the yeah. same time. Yeah. It can happen, whether it's the symptoms or whatever. But I feel that is another p uh, piece of the puzzle that's missing. Till today, we have even public officials who could bring out their faces and say, I have it. So it becomes less scary to, to people. Those are lost opportunities. Whenever you're a public figure, you have it and you don't declare it. Let people know it can happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. Like we say, it's, it's, it's no respect of persons. Mm -hmm. Let people know that it's happened to me, mm -hmm. I'm getting um, treatment and I'm well, mm -hmm. or I've recovered now. Yes, it's, it's important. And we should encourage more people to do that over and over. Now you have this project, and I'll come to you, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bachi. You have this project and the title, Safety of Markets and Preempting Stigmatization of COVID-19 Survivors, an Integrated Hygiene Behavior Change Campaign. It's, it's quite a, a mouthful, S-H-B-C-C. <laughs> Tell us a bit about the project. Tell us what exactly you hope to achieve with the project. All right, so I'll take this. Yeah. So um, th this is a project with the Water Aid and MasterCard Foundation. And um, what, what, it's all based on the fact that Water Aid had realized that there were problems in the market. You know, they do a lot of these hygiene things. So they push a lot with when it comes to their protocols, hand washing, uh, uh, stuff like that. And so the aim with this project is to be able to give support for those who are recovering or have recovered, psychological support, to be able to use some of these as role models to spread the message. So we, no, we normally have um, one or two that we come on programs with this, we couldn't do it this time. You know, and also to raise awareness and to develop trainers. 
So we are actually have a training guide, it's virtually done, and this is what they are going to be using. Right. And then finally, we are also coming to, which, which, are, which is very important to me, to the media space, to be able to um, engage as many media people as possible, so that whenever you are speaking, you can put in a word in there along the stigma. Everybody's doing the protocols, everybody's talking about the vaccine, but this is dangerous yet overlooked. Stigmatization could be killing more people than we I, even realize, I, yes, and we I, just don't have the statistics. Okay. Uh, we're wrapping up now. I'll take your final comments. But before I do so, uh, this thought just came to mind, Mr. Boachi. If I were to walk into any health facility, I know there's a paucity, shortage of um, uh, psychologists mm -hmm. or psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. What would be the likelihood of getting someone to attend to me, my mental whatever that I'm facing on the back of COVID? All right, so um, very interesting. The Ghana Psychological Association has identified this, and then they've made themselves available. Uh, there, this is a pool of psychologists in the association. And of course, I mean, we are, we are few, but uh, there are, we are spread across the country. And um, we are able to link facilities to um, psychologists. And I mean, I mean uh, this particular COVID has taught us that indeed we need to be proactive, and we have been. So at any point in time when someone needs a psychologist, there is a possibility and the availability of psychologists. Now, having said that, uh, I know it is not, it is not uh, maybe every institution that has this, but the people are there. We train psychologists every year. And how, now that you said it, I think it is important mm -hmm. that uh, the government takes this on okay. and employ more psychologists. Mm. Government should employ more psychologists, Mr. Bache. Because going uh, forward, we're going to have many, many of such. Right. And fortunately for us, with COVID now, we know that there's virtual. Mm. So many times we have, we refer people to the psychologists and they don't have to see them, you know. You can go physical. virtual with your psychologist. Exactly. So they're doing your concerns of that, and get and that saves time. 30 seconds each with your wrap-up comments. What do you want to leave Ghanaians and all those watching us this morning with? What's your final message? 30 seconds each. All right. So I say, Protocols can never work adequately with, if there is stigmatization. So let's clamp down on stigmatization. Right. That's extremely important. I'll still say, say this on stigmatization. Like he has said, indeed, if, if I don't come out to tell you, it is because of the fear that you will look down on me, you will stigmatize, you will point fingers. And so let us dissipate and diffuse that. Let's join and show love. Even though we are not facing, we are not sitting close to each other, we are not engaging in, in activities, we can do all of these virtual. Well, Dr. Russell, Mr. Wache, we're very grateful for your time. I've learned a lot. I don't know about the rest of you out there, but hopefully you've learned a thing or two too. But one major thing we want to leave you with, don't stigmatize. Uh, what you wouldn't want the other person to do to you, don't do to that person is the golden rule. When we return, there's a lot more. Have you heard about that artiste? Photocopy. Yeah, my colleague Maxwell Agbagba has more in that respect. But joining us for this conversation, Edwin Boache, clinical psychologist, Dr. Kojo Essel, medical doctor, health essentials. We'll be back.